basically were used as cheap labor uh, in fields as hired out as domestics, maybe in the local town and that kind of thing. Um, most of the schools tend to be concentrated in the West, uh, but you know they were all, almost in every province except some were maritime. And um, one of the guys in the video, the the Mountie, um, how did? I was just curious as to how he sort of got involved how on the other person, side yeah. of the. Well, I mean, uh, it's not unusual to see, uh, you know, native people involved to some degree with the police and that kind of thing. Oh. Uh, there are, you know, token native constables and that kind of thing, and he happened to be one. Uh, oh, okay, so he, well, okay. So. Yeah. I mean, he had a change of heart. George was telling me that he worked close with, I mean, you know, in a system like that, you're given at a young age, you know, several options. You, you, you cooperate or you die. You face some kind of torture or you hide. And those are the only options to a little kid. And so, you know, if you're in an abusive family, you can always run to the police, you can run to somebody else, but when the system is set up to do that to you, there's nowhere to go. Um, and so people make a decision how they survive in that, and often collusion is in their mind. Yeah. Um, so I guess the last thing to understand too is that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No. Um, what, is, do we know what like the root of this whole the root cause of this? Because why, why would the, the Cape Virginia government so against Andrews? Well, it's a whole history, and if anybody wants to jump here, in here, because this is a much bigger question that I think is really at the root of a lot of this. Uh, I think it's, it's, it goes back, because you see the same system in place in a lot of countries. Uh, the British tended to do this very effectively all over the world, um, where they would go into an area, pick indigenous people who would cooperate, and cultivate them, you know, the classic example was in India, where they would often take the Maharajas and the, the wealthy and train them at Oxford and Cambridge, and then send them back to administer India on behalf of the British Empire. And that system worked all over the world. Um, they tried in Ireland, well, to some degree they tried in Ireland, it didn't really work uh, there. Um, but, so in one sense, yeah, it's, it's how colonialism operates. But in terms of the, the boarding schools, it was also because of this, um, this sense in Canada, which had, a, uh, you know, in, to a great degree, this notion that there is no separation of church and state, uh, that, that they're all working towards this imperial purpose, which is that you get native people off the land, you make them like us, or you get rid of them. And they were very clear about that. Um, the, um, one of the examples of that is when they brought in the early sterilization laws, which was talked about later. Um, and there's a good book about that you should read if you're interested. It's called War Against the Weak by Edwin Black, America's Plan to Create a Master Race. And it's about the, I don't know if you've come across this term, eugenics. Yeah, we haven't gotten uh, there yet. But <laughs> you can afford a shock here, I see. Yeah, well, you got to get it out of the little, the little box yeah. over there. Yeah. Uh, eugenics. Has anybody, have you heard this term before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, it's about how the eugenics movement originated in America, uh, really among the, uh, in, this, in the psychiatric community. The notion that um, humanity is divided into, into you know, basically uh, inferior and superior species. Uh, and the ones who are inferior have to be brought out of existence. And so for example, the early sterilization laws that were brought in America were aimed at the so-called men of the unfit. So people who had low IQs were recommended for sterilization eugenics boards, which were set up in about 38 states. So the majority of states here had these laws. And in Canada, these eugenics laws were extended to include a lot more people, including Indians. Because it was understood that Indians, and the churches were very um, forefront in pushing these laws. Uh, it was believed that Native people, because they were Christian and because they were savage, um, were lower on the evolutionary scale and suffered a form of uh, cultural and mental defect because they weren't like us. And so clearly, they, on that basis, they were in the same category as a mentally incompetent person who shouldn't be allowed to, to propagate. And still under the Indian Act of Canada, natives are considered wards of the state, which is legally they're in that same position as if you were a child or a mentally incompetent person. They can't manage their own affairs. The state kind of uh, does that on their behalf. So all of that is vestiges of kind of an ideology that says that um, uh, you know, our imperial purpose, church and state together, is to make sure that our group triumphs. And 
that's, that's an old idea. Uh, there's a good book um, called Pagans in the Promised Land by Stephen Newcomb. And uh, Stephen Newcomb's a Cherokee scholar. He has a, a term he calls Christian superior dominion, or it's kind of the animating idea behind a lot of these laws that I mentioned coming from the Vatican and others, and that is Christians are, uh, have higher rights than anyone else on the planet, that the, the, the rights of other non-Christians are impaired because they're not Christian. And uh, therefore, when you go into an area, uh, the native people didn't, it was believed that native people in North America didn't actually own their own land. They merely occupied it. And they had sacrificed that right to their own land by not being Christian. That's what the early laws say. These people did that. So when you look at that whole history, naturally you're going to get into new boarding schools. Naturally all of this is going to happen because it comes out of a very old practice, which actually goes back to the Romans. And that's a whole other question, but this is based on kind of Roman law eventually. See, I think just uh, historically, Christianity didn't really uh, evolve from Christ. It evolved from Constantine, the Roman Empire. In that when you look at uh, historically, basically what happened, the Catholic Church amalgamated with the Roman Empire. They even adopted a lot of the symbols. Um, are any of you a Roman Catholic, just out of curiosity? I don't know if you've seen the symbol in, in church. It's like that. It's got an X in it. Sometimes on the, the like clerical the, garb of the priest. Like the Eucharist and yeah, well, they, it's supposed to represent Christ and everything, but it's a Roman cavalry symbol called the laburnum. And it was like a military symbol. Uh, the term diocese, that was a, that was a symbol of a unit within the Roman Empire. Uh, Pontifex Maximus, which is the term the Pope still uses for himself, great bridge builder. That was the Roman Emperor's term. I mean, all of these terms were just adopted wholesale by the church. And um, what went along with that adoption was the idea that you had kind of a synthesis developed. Because when you look at the, the Christianity as a faith, it's not based on empire and conquest. Quite the opposite when you read the teachings of Jesus. But Christianity is something different because it became a synthesis of that church with a Roman imperial idea of the right of conquest. So in effect, the, the synthesis that comes out at the other end is this idea that Christianity is, uh, there is no salvation outside Christianity. And in union with various empires and governments, the church has the right to impose that faith on anybody on earth for their own salvation. And that's the thing to understand, that it's the original motive is that it, this is necessary for the salvation of humanity, but any means is, is uh, okay to achieve that. And if, when you read the, uh, if any of you ever kind of do much theological reading, uh, the three fathers of the church, Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas. Each one of those people, Aristotle, of course, wasn't a Christian. He was a full, you know, Greek philosopher. But he had the idea that humanity was divided into natural orders of, of the elect and the damned, if you like, and that people were slaves in ancient Greece because they were morally defective, because they, they were um, people who were conquered in war had lost the right uh, to themselves. These ideas run all through Aristotle. The church adopts that. Augustine uh, develops the uh, just war theory, which is kind of a complete uh, subversion of Jesus' teachings of loving your enemy and nonviolence. Right? Uh, and there's an interesting evolution. I, I, I found these quotes um, in the year 210, the Church of Rome. Again, they're not at that point incorporated in the empire. They're just they're they're persecuted. They're like an underground movement. And there's a there's a, a letter from that I've got in my book, um, a letter from the bishops of the Roman Church to their people, and it says, "You cannot join the army, and you cannot fight. And if you're a soldier and you convert to Christianity, you have to leave the army or tell your officer you won't obey an order to kill, because a Christian doesn't kill. I mean, it's right there, love your enemy. But the means of, of propagating Christianity in the world is through love and nonviolence." A century later, it wasn't even a century, it was 305, okay? That's when the church is beginning to incorporate, and it, it incorporates under Roman law as a corporation for the first time, so we can inherit, it can receive inheritances and bequests. The same church, less than a century later, is saying, uh, 
uh, Christians must pay homage to the emperor and must fight in the Roman in the emperor's armies. Okay, that's a 180 degree turn. Suddenly Christians can use violence, they can be soldiers. And that happened, and that's still the case today. Uh, I had a personal experience of that when I was uh, newly ordained. It was when the first Gulf War broke out. And uh, I got up, I was kind of curious what people were doing. I, uh, I got up in the Presbyterian meeting and I said, I, I made a motion that the United Church of Canada take out a full page ad in the Globe and Mail with a picture of Saddam Hussein. And then underneath it write, love your enemy, the United Church of Canada. Right? So in other words, just say what Jesus did. Let's try loving our enemies, right? <laughs> the uproar, the uprage, uh, outrage and uproar that happened in that time was unbelievable. I was, you know, people were saying, you know, you're, you're defining the memory of our veterans who fought in the war. Uh, this is a madman and a dictator who we have to oppose, just like we had to fight Hitler. I mean, all the arguments you always hear in times of war. And I said, look, don't get mad at me, get mad at Jesus, because he's on steam. But that, in microcosm, I think is an example of what we're dealing with, because the most basic fundamental teaching of Christ, which some uh, churches in, in the Christian tradition still uh, follow, like the Mennonite and the, the, uh, the Anabaptist movement in Europe, uh, and, and the Quakers, uh, were devoted to the notion that you don't pay taxes and you don't serve in war. Uh, and governments even allow people the right to do that, uh, you know, to uh, uh, conscientious objectors in that kind of war. But what I find interesting is the fact that no mainstream church is allowed to practice that, the most fundamental teaching of Christ, because to do so goes up against the arrangement that they've had with every government. And uh, this is really at the heart of your question, because Martin Luther called it the two swords theology. And that is, the government and the church are in a symbiotic relationship. Okay? The government protects the church, including from dissidents within its own ranks. Okay? And the church provides good and loyal citizens that's why they don't pay taxes. That's why they perform certain functions of the state, like marriages uh, and that kind of thing. They're civil servants, if you like. So, in effect, what the churches have become are an extension and are an arm of the state. And that's why, historically, you can have all of these schools being run and children dying, because the churches and the government are acting as part of the same thing. So it's part of that whole history, and it's really quite amazing, fascinating when you look at it, because, uh, you know, it's kind of like this... Uh, explosive idea within Christianity which is contained by the institution of the church and that is basically um, well um, Christians in 